So hi everyone, my name is David. I'm from Penn State University and I'm going to talk today about direct dark matter searches with the LZ experiment. Um, so this title slide is a picture of um, the Sanford Underground Research Facility. Um, this is where I do most of my work uh, on site here um, at SURF and this is the host institution for the, for the LZ experiment. So I'm just trying to advance my slides here. Okay, so I thought I'd start with a uh, quick uh, overview of direct dark matter detection. And uh, we've already heard a lot about this in this session, so I won't dwell too much on the details. Uh, just to emphasize the main points, um, that this is quite a simple concept. Uh, we're looking to directly detect uh, recoils of dark matter particles bumping into standard model particles in our detector medium. Um, this is a very model independent way to look for dark matter. Uh, we can search for a variety of different candidates. Um, but it's very challenging in practice. Um, the event rates are very low. Um, so you either need to build a very big detector or run it for a very long time. Um, and they also involve very small energy transfers. Um, so you need to build a very sensitive detector uh, to detect those low energy recoils. Um, so all of this means there are some generic features to these types of searches. Um, you need to operate your detector underground. Uh, you need to build your detector from very radio pure materials uh, so you don't just basically see all of the backgrounds from your own detector. Um, for the similar reasons, you need to construct everything inside of a clean room to uh, reduce radon exposure and dust exposure. Um, and for some uh, direct searches, um, such as LZ, um, which is using liquid xenon, uh, you actually need to clean your detector medium. Uh, so for xenon, we're very worried about krypton, uh, which we would see in our detector um, if we didn't remove it. So LZ is a two-phase uh, noble TPC. Um, so this is a technology that's really leading the way for searches of intermediate and high mass uh, WIMPs. And um, I just wanted to explain a little bit how the TPC works. Again, we've already covered this a little bit in this session, so I won't spend too long on this. Um, but basically the key point is that for every interaction inside of this detector, uh, we get two observable signals, a prompt scintillation light, which we call the S1 signal, and a delayed response from the ionization, which we call the S2 signal. And each of those two signals together um, tell us a few things about the interaction that happened inside of our detector. It tells us the position because we know which PMTs saw some light in the S2 signal, and we know the difference between the S1 and the S2 signal in time, uh, so we can reconstruct the depth of the event. Um, we can figure out the energy of the event from the two signals together, um, and obviously we use detector calibrations to calibrate our detector. And we also get recoil identification. So we know if there was an electron recoil or a nuclear recoil um, by the ratio of the S1 and the S2 light. And in the bottom left of this slide, I'm showing um, some calibration data from the Lux experiment, which shows the distinction between these two recoil populations quite clearly. Um, and Lux is able to demonstrate 99.8% discrimination power between these two recoil channels um, with 50% acceptance of the nuclear recoils. So everything below the the mean of this uh, yellow orange band here. Uh, bigger detectors have slightly less discrimination power, but still very high. Um, nominally for LZ, we're assuming 99.5% discrimination. Uh, just to mention as well, the LZ um, is a liquid xenon TPC. So it will utilize seven tons of liquid xenon in this active region where the electric field is applied to drift the ionization electrons and utilizing almost 500 PMTs in the top and bottom arrays. So this is a slide just generally, um, you know, how these searches work, how do we hunt for dark matter. Um, basically, you're looking uh, to take your data and apply various analysis cuts to remove events that you know are probably going to be backgrounds. So this is an example of one such cut. Um, it's a fiducial cut, um, which is just taking events in the inner portion of the detector. And that's because backgrounds like to accumulate on the outside of uh, the TPC. Uh, backgrounds from external radioactivity uh, that basically get absorbed in the outer layer of the xenon uh, in the NLZ's case. Um, so we look inside of the center of the detector to be more sensitive to dark matter. And this is uh, background data from the Lux experiment on the left. And on the right, I'm just saying what you would do then with that final um, data set. Um, you would basically do a hypothesis test to see does your data look like your expected backgrounds, which is maybe a flat spectrum at low energies, the red um, line here, um, or does it look like background plus signal, 
Um, and here I sketched a signal model for WIMPs, but it could be any dark matter candidate um, that, that you're comparing your data to. And typically, we use a profile likelihood ratio analysis to do this. And things are parameterized in terms of the observables, the S1, the S2, um, and the positions of the events. So everything I've said so far has been very generic. Um, now I'd like to talk about Lux Zeppelin or LZ. This is the experiment that I work on. Um, this is a picture of our assembled TPC in the Surface Assembly Lab at SURF. This is before it went underground to be integrated with the rest of the system. And this is um, a model of the full LZ detector systems. Um, so we have that central TPC, which I showed on the previous slide. That's in the middle. That's the heart of our detector where we look for dark matter. Um, that sits inside of a Krystat vessel. Um, so we need a Krystat vessel to, to keep the detector cold, um, to maintain a liquid xenon, uh, xenon in the liquid phase. Um, and because you have a TPC inside of a Krystat vessel, you have this region uh, just outside of the TPC, but inside of the Krystat uh, filled with liquid xenon. For LZ, we actually instrument that region and we call it the liquid xenon skin. Um, so as well as acting as a shield for external radiation, um, the fact that it's instrumented allows us to detect additional events happening inside of the skin region. Um, so if we get coincident signals between the TPC and the skin region, uh, we can reject those events as being backgrounds. Similarly, we have an outer detector, uh, which is actually a gadolinium loaded liquid scintillator. Uh, so this is held in acrylic tanks just outside of the Krystat volume. And the idea of the scintillator is to capture neutrons, uh, which um, if they scatter once inside of our TPC, they look exactly like a WIMP. Um, and so we capture the neutrons as they um, go out of the TPC. Um, and if we can do that, then um, we can also veto those type of events too. And the gadolinium is a, has a high neutron capture cross-section uh, emitting uh, gamma rays, which we detect using outer detector PMTs. Those PMTs can also look for Cherenkov light from the water tank. So that can tag things like muons going through. Um, and the water tank itself is a big shield uh, for ambient gamma rays um, on neutrons from the, the cavern rock. Um, and all of this sits inside of a, an underground cavern. We also have on the outside of the detector, a liquid xenon tower, which is how we liquefy the xenon, the gaseous xenon, and it's transported into the TPC via these transfer lines at the bottom of the detector. And as I mentioned, we're utilizing uh, 10 tons of xenon in total, seven tons in the active region of the TPC. So this is a slide just demonstrating that the, the great thing about LZ and also other experiments that are coming online soon um, with, with higher masses is not just um, their better exposure because they're bigger, but also the vetoing power of this outer detector. Um, so here you're seeing a hit map of events from nuclear recall backgrounds. Uh, on the left, you're seeing the distribution of events before we apply any veto cuts. Um, so this is Z and R square, are the, the axes here. Then after you apply vetoing, so after you take into account your uh, outer detector, um, you can see that the backgrounds are significantly reduced and it allows us to expand this fiducial volume that we look for dark matter in this dashed line here um, to uh, maximize the, the mass that we're using for the dark matter search. And you get roughly an order of magnitude reduction in your nuclear recall backgrounds. And for LZ, we expect that this fiducial volume will be 5.6 tons. Uh, so we're using 5.6 of the seven tons we have available to actually do science. The next couple of slides are just going to show you some pictures of the progress um, of LZ and take you from a CAD model into real life. Um, so the top left is uh, the acrylic tanks that we use to house the gadolinium loaded liquid scintillator that's the outer detector. That's been lowered into the water tank here. Uh, you have the components of the TPC on the top and the right. Uh, so you have the high voltage. Um, we did some testing at LBL for that. Um, PMT arrays um, as they sat in the surface assembly lab before being integrated into the TPC. You have the TPC on the right hand side of the slide. Um, the bottom right shows the water tank, which is sitting inside of the Davis cavern at SURF. That's where everything goes um, to ultimately be integrated. Um, and then on the left hand side, you see the two Krystat vessels, the inner vessel being lowered into the outer vessel. Um, and on the inside of the inner vessel, we have this PTFE paneling, which 
uh, improves light collection efficiency in the skin region. And you can also see the PTFE panels on the TPC in the top right picture. Uh, that's to reflect light internally inside the TPC to, uh, to improve our energy thresholds. Another key component about this is the xenon purification systems. Um, so as I mentioned, you have to clean your xenon. We do that at Slack using a krypton removal system that's based on gas chromatography. That's then transported to site. Uh, the bottom left is showing a picture of me working on the xenon packs on site. Um, and all of that gets put into the system as, a, as gaseous xenon. Um, it's circulated around the system, uh, purified constantly using a, a getter, uh, which is a hot zirconium getter. Um, and then liquefied in this uh, cryo tower, which sits just outside the water tank and liquid is transported into the detector. And we have uh, cryogenic systems for, all, for cooling all of, this, uh, all of this stuff. So at the same time as the hardware integration, we're also uh, doing simulations and sensitivity studies and background estimates. So all of the details are on this slide. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'm just gonna basically highlight the key points, which is that uh, for electron recoil backgrounds, we're limited by uh, radon, radon 222 specifically. Um, and for nuclear recall backgrounds, we're, we're basically sensitive to uh, neutrinos uh, from the sun, and that's basically equivalent to our um, backgrounds from the detector and the environment. This is our projected WIMP sensitivity. Um, we have the best sensitivity at 40 GeV, um, 1.4 times 10 to the minus 48 centimeters square. So very much similar to xenon enton sensitivity. Um, both of those experiments are going to push us towards the neutrino floor in this WIMP phase space. We can also try and look for low mass dark matter. Um, so you'll notice on the previous slide how um, the, the cross-section null sensitivity goes up at low masses. Um, xenon TPCs can look for sub-GV dark matter by uh, trying to reduce the energy thresholds, which are mostly set by requirements on the S1 signal. So we can get around that by just looking in the S2 only channel or we can try and remove the coincident requirements on the S1 signal by utilizing this thing called the double photoelectron emission effect, uh, which basically identifies real VUV photons from xenon scintillation from backgrounds from PMT dark counts. And we can also utilize the Bremsstrahlung and Migdal effects, which we heard about earlier in this session, uh, just to say that in xenon TPCs, ER signals um, give a stronger signal um, at low energies than nuclear recoils. Uh, so we can very effectively use this to, um, to search for lower mass dark matter. And then my final two slides, I have to wrap up here, but the final two slides are just showing what LZ can do for the ER channel searches. Uh, so this is the LZ sensitivity to axions and axion light particles, which are obviously very topical right now with the xenon one ton excess. Um, the LZ projected sensitivity for solar axions um, is um, going to set world leading, world leading uh, limits or, or potential discovery. Um, as far as direct research go, it's still uh, above the limit set by uh, astrophysical um, observations, uh, studies of red, of red giants. Um, and for Alps, again, world, world leading sensitivity. And in the ER channel, um, uh, we, ha we have searches for hidden, hidden photons and mirror dark matter in the, in the hidden sector. And again, we're, we're uh, on course to set, uh, to have world-leading sensitivity to these to these two types of physics. Uh, just to just to advertise, Elizabeth Leeson has a uh, has a poster uh, on ER searches, um, so I encourage everyone to to go look at that poster for more details on these particular analyses. Um, so that's it. Thank you for listening. Obviously, um, it's a shame that we can't all be together to just to discuss science, but thank you to the organizers for this excellent uh, online workshop. And this is the LZ collaboration when we met in July uh, earlier this year. Thank you.